yesterday, uh, Seb and Jonathan both started off their talks talking about Commodore 64s, which um, made me feel a bit cheap, because um, if you were you know, around at the time, uh, Commodore 64s were a little bit more expensive than the computers that we had, uh, which was an uh, Acorn Electron. I don't know if anyone remembers BBC Micros or Acorn Electrons. It was maybe only very much a UK thing. But uh, I was 10 at the time, and, and I loved it. I loved um, one bit in particular, uh, which was this. So any game that you had to do, you had to write out by hand, or you could maybe load it by cassette or floppy or something, but usually we had to write it by hand. And part of that writing was creating the, these little sprites, these little characters for the games. And you can see how these were created. It was quite a process. So you had to fill in this grid, and then you had to work out, OK, so that top line is 16 plus 8, so that's 24. So eventually, you would have uh, this VDU statement at the bottom that you could use to actually create these little icons. Um, so that was my first sort of foray into computer graphics, as it were. Um, but what I really wanted to do for a living uh, was this. I trained to do natural history illustration. Um, and I saw my life you know, living on some obscure Scottish island, uh, studying wildlife, painting it, um, and that's what I would do. But it was a very hard market to get into. So I actually have ended up being, uh, by a little bit of a roundabout way, once I left college, finding a job as a junior designer, and then um, finding out codes and webs, and just getting into the whole um, CSS and HTML movement just at about the time that Zeldman released his famous uh, Designing with Web Standards. But these, um, these skills that I picked up at college for doing wildlife illustration have something that I've actually used later on, um, because I've been doing things like uh, well, Firefox, which is now uh, 11 years old now, it's getting on a bit, uh, MailChimp and Shopify, which is one of the sponsors, uh, and a bit more recently, things like the uh, Skype emoticons uh, redesign. So these skills were very useful to, uh, uh, to reuse, and I still kind of have that, um, that skill set. Um, so it means that basically nowadays, I don't do much in the way of websites. I do a lot of interface design, uh, but the thing I'm known for now really is icon design. So uh, the, this culminated in uh, two years ago, I wrote a book. Um, and like all books, uh, they go out of date more or less as soon as you actually publish them. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is actually sort of building on that rather than repeating a lot of it and bring it up to date because there's a lot of new stuff to do, look about with um, icon fonts and SVG. Uh, so I'm going to bring that all up to date now. But let's, let's take a step back and have a look at how we use our icons. And this is the main uh, way you would see icons being used, perhaps, for wayfinding, for navigation. Uh, this is for the uh, Spotify redesign that I was involved with. Um, I didn't do the design, but I was involved in all the icon set. That was all my, uh, my recent work. So at the side here, you've got this uh, typical menu. Now, it's one of these things that, you know, it would work without the icons. You could take the icons away and just have the text labels, and it would all be fine. But Adding that line of uh, icons gives it another quick way of scanning, way of quick finding that thing you need. And then all those categories that come in on the browse section, again, they're very much uh, wayfinding again. And you know, the text label is enough to, to give you an idea, but by giving a large icon such as this, you can navigate it much easier. But we also use icons without them. Uh, it tends to be for things like functions. So say the, the player interface, uh, you would never have play, forward, back, skip, shuffle uh, actually labeled out. So for these, we actually use just small icons, but these are ones that are, uh, are memorable. Um, another reason we use icons then is because of, of languages. Um, so take, for example, these are some various ways of saying the word menu. But now we all know that that means menu, and it's a much simpler and easier way to do it. Although, erroneously, I think this is called a burger menu. Have you heard this term, burger menu? Which, it doesn't look like a burger, 
It looks like a club sandwich or three planks. That's a burger menu. <laughs> Another great use for icons uh, is for giving feedback. Um, and I take this form, for example. Some people uh, just give feedback in forms just by simply putting a red outline around the field that's wrong, um, which is fine, unless, like me, you're colorblind and it doesn't look any different to green. Um, so what GrooveShark has done here, as well as providing color, they're not relying completely on color. So there's actually an icon on the inside there to, just to give it a bit of um, a recognition. Um, this is a good example of uh, what I have to do a lot of the time. It's, I just realized it's a very bad example, because it's actually got a battery full and a battery charging light. And I've only just noticed this. This must be the third time I've given this talk with this, um, with this image in it. So never mind. Imagine there was only one light, and it was green and then red. Oh, sorry, red and then green. That's what I usually have to contend with. So I usually have to take pictures of these and take them to my wife and say, what color is this? Is it red yet? Is it green yet? So yeah, try not to rely on color at all, and think about icons for that. Um, emoticons, we often use uh, emoticons to express mood. Um, sometimes it can just add a bit of levity to a, a chat or a conversation. Um, but as the comic book guy in The Simpsons has always said, there is no emoticon for what I am feeling. So it doesn't always work. Now there's a lot of um, free and royalty-free icon sets out there. So when you're doing your projects, um, your first step is probably to go out and look for these. This is one of my favorite ones. This is called Iconic. And it goes particularly uh, in depth with all its features, such as animations and different ways of coloring it. Um, so with so many of these already available, um, why would you need to create your own? Especially when this particular icon set gets described as calm and assured. Neatly rounded corners amplify the geometry of the forms with quick turns and an easy confidence. And it goes on into about mechanical and natural approach with equal fervor. I mean, goodness me, you know, they're little pictures, you know. But at the same time, you know, these little pictures can, can work and they can be very useful for you. So um, why bother making your own? Well, the first problem with these sets is that they might not be in the right size. Often what you're doing with icons is sizing them with the accompanying text. And it might be that certainly a lot of icon sets make this, um, uh, they only have sort of quite large sizes, and you may need very small ones. They might not have been the right style. You know, you've got a very particular look and feel to your site or your app, and you need it to sort of harmonize with that. But a lot of these you know, may be just not quite right. Uh, there may be a lot of spare icons that you don't need. Um, some sets are very clever in that you can only choose which ones you want to, to actually deploy, uh, deploy and load. But some of them are in terms of an icon font where you get the whole thing. So there's a lot of extra um, bandwidth that you don't really want to have to spare. And also, they might not have the right icons at all. You know, if you're someone like GitHub or GitHub, um, you, you, know, you might not have things for repository icons or for, for doing pull requests and push and that kind of thing. You know, it might be a very specialist subject there. You just don't get those kind of, the sort of standards icon sets just don't fulfill that need. So this is the point really where um, this talk comes in. So it's all about the icon design process for making your own icons. And I'm gonna split this up into three sections. So we're going to have a research section. We're going to do the drawing, actually handle how we create these. And then also the deployment. So we're going to look at whether to use things like icon fonts or SVG or, or you know, what the latest techniques are. And before each of these sections, I'm just going to punctuate it with toilet signage. Because um, this is quite, quite a good sound bite, I don't know. Um, I love toilet, toilet signage. So, no, let me say that again. I love toilet signage. Uh, that was cleaner. Um, <laughs> oh, God, it's early. Um, because toilet signage is great, it's so open to interpretation. And I'm sure you've all seen this one. This is a very sort of famous one. 
uh, from the internet. Uh, push button and receive bacon. Fantastic. If only, eh? Yeah. So let's go to that first stage. We're going to look at the metaphors. Um, often an icon project starts with something as, as dull as this, you know, a big spreadsheet which describes uh, the name of the icon, how it's being used, the location, because the context is very important, um, any notes and kind of general ideas of sizing. But if they're actually carrying out an audit, uh, this is a client uh, from Australia, and what they found was with, across all their, their work, that, which was the website, uh, phone applications, packaging, they're actually starting to use different icons. So I don't know if you can see this one here for troubleshooting. They're using a question mark in some places and a uh, spanner and screwdriver icon in others. But they didn't really realize this until they'd brought it all together into one big spreadsheet. So just take one of those. Let's say um, something a little bit more unusual, like view. Um, how do you get from a word to an actual icon? Well, the first thing we've got to think is the metaphor because uh, there's basically two different types that you could use. You could be iconic. This is where the icon actually represents something that's familiar, that's, that's real, uh, or they're symbolic. So it doesn't actually have any relation to anything in real life, and it's, it's something that has to be learned. It's something that uh, you have to, um, uh, over time, get to know that that means refresh, for example. So it's harder with a, a symbolic icon, but then also with the problem with iconic icons is things like the floppy disk for save. You know, how long can we keep using that? We've already pretty much stopped using that in a lot of new applications. Uh, conventions are one of the most important things with icons because um, if the icon is to represent home, then show a home, show that classic home, roof, chimney, because we can recognize that. Don't try and be a bit too clever. Um, for example, uh, a welcome mat that you might find outside a house. Um, it's just too esoteric. Before we had conventions, it made life a lot hard. Anyone remember all these various different icons we had for RSS? Because, um, you know, now it kind of makes sense we've got a new icon, but we've got a love heart, sweet, we've got a cup of coffee, I had no idea why we had a pill for RSS. Which, you know, when you think of RSS, what it is, it's you know, news feed, and it's, I have no idea how they got to that. A coffee cup, I could understand. So we had loads of these, um, until uh, a guy called Stephen Hallander, who was working on the Firefox interface, uh, came up with this. Um, it was slightly based on the kind of the Wi-Fi icon or the airport icon in, on a Mac. Um, but almost overnight, this got adopted, especially when Microsoft started using it, and suddenly it became a, a convention. So finally, we had one icon that we could use to represent RSS. Now, if there isn't a convention already, if you have to sort of start thinking of a new one or trying to work out you know, what conventions there are for an icon, uh, a really good starting point is the noun project. So you can type in a search term here and see a variety of uh, different icon metaphors. So for example, for view, we've got glasses, binoculars, uh, cable car, which I can, you know, it took me a few seconds to realize what that was about. Um, it's obviously a little bit kind of literal in terms of a nice view, but, uh, but this is quite useful to actually um, see all these different, different versions you could use. Now, it's very fine to, to look at these things and think, okay, well, um, say, for example, uh, I need to, to show wisdom or uh, learning or knowledge. Uh, I would most normally use an owl for that. Uh, in the West, the owl means wisdom. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in the East, it means stupidity. So uh, the complete opposite, which is handy. Uh, for example, the thumbs up. Uh, usually that means okay, or great, or approve, or like, obviously with Facebook. Um, apart from places like in the parts of the Middle East, that means screw you, or, or yours. It's, it's very rude. 
Um, and uh, this is an example of an icon I did for a, a bank in Australia. Um, we were trying to do savings, which is quite hard when you've already had a, a lot of other bank icons with various sort of piles of money and things. So we thought, well, um, savings banks, piggy banks, um, I checked with the clients, and that was still you know, applicable to Australia. Unfortunately, one of their markets, which was Indonesia and Malaysia, um, a pig is seen as a dirty animal, and that was a definite no. So it's useful to have these, um, these bits of knowledge. I think one of the best ones was uh, for Skype. This chap in the middle is called Bao. If you've used the Bao icon, you maybe don't, because it's not something we um, tend to use very much, but it's used a lot in the East, where emoji is very popular. Um, but it has to be this particular uh, stance. So hands crossed in the front like that. Because if you do this, which is what we think of as bow, or I think of as bow, uh, it simply means I want to die, I want to hang myself. So, <laughs> um, so it, it's useful to find these things out before we deployed them. You know, it's, um, it, it's, it's used a lot. This, this one in the middle means warmth and sincerity. Now, if you've gone through all this stage and you haven't found a convention, then you know, that's when sketching comes in, obviously. But doing a kind of a mind map, um, you know, starting with your, your thing in the middle, uh, you can start trying out different ideas. So, for example, uh, glasses could be a bit of Harry Potter. Uh, a view horizon, that's like the cable car, way too literal. Eyes, you could use eyes, but I kind of thought, well, this is a bit too creepy, I think. And there's things like, well, a telescope. But the problem with an icon is that you're talking about a square boundary all the time. So basically, to make the telescope any sort of decent size, you're going to have to run it diagonally in that box, which it doesn't fit well. You've got a large, empty space of two corners. And also, it could be anything, couldn't it? You know, it's a very difficult shape to, to show, clearly. So in this example, I felt that Actually, yes, binoculars is going to be a, a much clearer symbol to use. So that's good for that kind of icon. But if you're doing an emoticon, uh, what you actually need to do is uh, find facial reference. And uh, this is something that a lot of animators do, and that especially uh, Pixar. Um, they'll just have a mirror uh, in front of them, and they'll constantly look at themselves while they're animating. So if you're working on an emoticon, and you've got a camera in your computer, and you're trying to work out a what-the-fuck icon, um, it's very handy. And things like fingers crossed, well, you know, rather than trawl the internet for finding exactly the right picture of fingers crossed, I'll just take a picture of myself. La, 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 I can't hear you. Or, or waiting. So these are very useful just to get that kind of quick bit of reference. So, we're going to move on to the next section, which is drawing, which means number two of the toilet signage. Applaud the jellyfish. <laughs> I, yeah, I was trying to do a sound bite there as well, wasn't I? <laughs> so, let's look at the drawing. Now, when you've got your, your metaphor ready, um, the, the job isn't finished by a long chalk because there are so many different styles you can use to actually to portray this. Um, you can show it front on or from the top. You can show it three-quarter view. Or you can show it um, just as an outline or as a sketchy style. It's very difficult to know. Um, this is part of what your, your site design is, uh, is related to and what fits in with it. Um, but sometimes it's hard to know what's the most effective. And especially with the outline icons. There's been a lot of talk recently about how um, these outline icons take a lot longer to process mentally than a solid fill icon. Well, actually, um, Boxes and Arrows did a little survey about this to try and see, is there any sort of, um, fact behind this? And what they found was this. So the ones that are green were recognized more quickly and actually, the thing that, that made it different was the iconic icons. So we were talking at the start about how if they're symbolic or if they're iconic. But if they're iconic and they actually relate to a physical object that we're familiar with, um, that made it much, much quicker to, to recognize. 
And even when you've got to a style, um, you can go through hundreds of iterations of just trying to find the exact right way to do it, because you're trying to make it simple. Um, yeah, trying to make it simple. Don't get too fancy. Um, it is tempting sometimes to make it, oh, let's make it a bit more arty, a bit, a bit, more, a bit more to it. Um, but they're not there for art or decoration. They're there for uh, recognition and wayfinding. So don't get too fancy with it. But you can get too simple. So let's take, for example, on the far left here, we have a padlock for security. In the middle, we have a shopping bag. And on the far right, we have a 20-ton weight for weight. Now, um, they are very, very similar. So this obviously has gone too simple. Um, what can you add to this to make these uh, clearer? So for example, on the padlock, we can add back in the, the hole, the, the padlock hole. Uh, for the shopping bag, we can actually add any kind of little graphic that's different just to, to make it obvious. And on the weight, we can maybe add a number, for example, um, to, to recognize that. But it's, it's often a, not a good idea to use things like letters and numbers simply because, again, because of localization. Um, it won't always be the same letter in every country, but with numbers, it's a little bit easier. Um, but the important thing is context. So actually, if you saw these icons in context, um, and whether you'd actually have a site that was a secure shopping site for 20 ton weights, um, you know, whether you'd actually get them all together, I don't know. So what do we actually use to create them? Everyone's got their own special tool. It's Photoshop. A lot of people seem to use Photoshop for doing any kind of vector icons. Um, I'd rather throw myself on a fork than use Photoshop for icons. But um, that's only my personal taste. And a lot of people have a really good workflow uh, using Photoshop. Uh, until recently, I've been using mostly Adobe Illustrator um, for doing this kind of work, uh, especially good for any kind of detailed icons. Uh, Inkscape is a good open source uh, SVG editor if you want to use that. Um, but the one that I'm really starting to love these days is one called Sketch. Um, it's, it's very much uh, a new way of thinking. Uh, it's very good at exporting S SVG, which the other ones aren't, apart from Inkscape, sorry. But whatever you use, the important thing is you need to decide and make sure that you've got locked. Uh, the icon size and style. The final export format, which has got to be SVG in our case. And the other thing is to work on all the icons together. You need to work on them to get them balanced correctly and get them all harmonious. So rather than having one icon per file, you need to have one big file with all the icons in it. Um, and this is how I used to do it in Illustrator. You could do uh, little slices uh, of a big grid, and you could just export them all to SVG. And it was great. It was fine. And then Adobe removed it. So just as SVG was starting to get popular, they decided, ah, oh, let's just take that out. So now you have to use what Illustrator calls artboards, a bit like this. And that's OK. You can, you can uh, export each artboard to SVG files, except that you're limited to 100 in Illustrator. And I think someone somewhere just thought, I, no one's going to want to do more than 100. So they just put this arbitrary limit in. But it, obviously, if you're doing a, an icon set like uh, Spotify, uh, with each icon's got uh, three or four different size versions of it, you can get to 100 very easily. So this is why I prefer Sketch a lot. Um, Sketch is very good. You can basically export a slice, an artboard, a layer, whatever is the most convenient to you. And you can export it as everything, SVG, PNG, EPS, all at once, very easy. Uh, the place where Sketch is a little bit uh, shaky at the moment, is a little bit buggy, and for kind of detailed icon work, it can be a little bit trying, a bit kind of a bit stressful. Uh, Illustrator is definitely a more mature tool. But if you haven't tried Sketch, please do, because it's, it's maturing and it's getting better all the time. It's really being developed very, very rapidly. So what this gives us, once we're opened our application, is a grid. 
Uh, this is a 32 pixel icon, um, which is just good for showing quite nice and large. But that natural pixel grid already gives us something to work to, as you would work with a grid for a layout on a, on a website. But you don't necessarily have to stick to a, a 16 pixel grid. That's the very common one, 16 pixels, 32 pixels, easy multiples of that. Um, but take, for example, this one here. Um, this stem here on this arrow has got a four pixel wide stem. But if you went for an odd numbered icon grid, you could use three. Um, it also makes the sharp point uh, of the arrow more obvious, uh, whereas the blurring on this one, it's, it, it rounds it off a bit more. This is a problem that we're not going to have. The more high density resolution screens we're getting, you're not going to have to worry about this little sub-pixel rendering of a sharp arrow point. But do think about an odd-numbered grid as giving you little options. And when you're sizing icons up, this is an example from Spotify. So we've got a 16-pixel at the start, and they also wanted 32-pixel and 64-pixel versions. Um, but just by doing it uh, equally, it made the larger icons feel very clunky, very chunky and heavy. So it may be that actually what you're doing on the larger ones is making that line thinner. It's a lot like what Jonathan Heffler was talking about yesterday with the typography and about how optimizing for different sizes means that you're often changing that weight um, to making it more appealing at larger sizes. You can also add detail. This is an example from the iconic set I mentioned. So here, um, You've got the icons in their right sort of relative sizes at the top, and then sort of blown up to the same size at the bottom. And you can see how, with those larger icons, it's fine to add just little bits of detail to make that more interesting. But for the smaller sizes, just how simple it is. But the most important part of this, again, as I mentioned before, about putting everything in one document, is balance. So if you've got a, an icon boundary like this, it's tempting to fill it completely with your shape. And what that means is that here, for example, the square seems huge compared to the star. Um, and the cross and the, the plus icon, again, don't look as big as the circle. So what we need to do is, is make these more relative. So the star is a good example of one that will allow to fill that entire space. But the uh, square is going to have to be a little bit smaller than the circle. Um, and again, the plus and the, uh, the cross can be, just, again, just that little bit, bit larger. It's, when you're dealing with just like one or two pixels, sometimes these differences can be a little bit hard to show. But certainly as the icon size grows, it's useful to, to look at this safe area that you can use. Let's have a quick look at alignment. Again, if you try to align the icon within that boundary equally, so you've got the same padding top and bottom, and you've got the same padding left and right. That will often make that, in this case, this icon, uh, look completely out of alignment. And actually, by placing it right over here, the large visual weight of the icon is actually in the center, and that actually starts to look right. And especially if we look with other icons. This thumbs up icon, again, has been centered vertically. But it makes it look out of alignment vertically with the refresh icon. So what we need to do is actually move that right up. Because again, the large visual weight is that big chunk in the middle. And that's what we're trying to align generally with. You can also have a think um, when you're constructing these icons about uh, negative space. Now, you may not have a lot of, want to put a lot of detail in it. But just by putting things like a slightly thicker line under the lid of that plant pot, just to suggest a shadow, or just me even missing out a little bit of the stem of this plant here. It suggests, first of all, there's a highlight at the top there, um, and it creates a nice visual separation between those two things. And again, if it's reversed, we can just use that negative space to show a little bit of shadow, um, and it just gives a little bit more life. So we're at a good stage now. We've uh, constructed our icon, and we're now going to go through the process of getting it ready for export. And here's another example of a settings icon. So this is made up of all sorts of different 
uh, strokes, rectangles, rounded boxes, um, and bits here like um, these gaps here are done by just simply putting a rectangle on top. But we want a one compound shape that we can use to actually export it to. So, if you're using something like Illustrator, use the expand appearance. You're turning all your strokes into outlines, and then you're unifying that whole thing. But we want to, just before we save that to SVG, we just want to have a quick look. Because you see in this section here where we had that middle bit, there are these two little nodes here. And we, we can get rid of those safely without affecting any artwork. Now, that will help save a little bit of space on the file. You know, it may only be less than a K, maybe a few bytes. But if you did that for every icon within a large icon set, then you're optimizing really well. And we're finally going to export the SVG. If you're an illustrator, you get more options. So the main ones to look at are making sure it's SVG 1.1, and the big one is making the decimal place 1, because we don't need any more than that. So for each node, each part of our path, um, there'll be a coordinate, but we don't need any more than one decimal place on that. And that can, can add a lot of bulk to the file. We can also optimize it really well. So there's things like uh, SVGOGY, which is what I use sometimes, uh, where you can just literally shove a load of SVGs in it and look at some of the savings you can make. Gets rid of all the cruft, all the bits of Illustrator that you don't want. Uh, but it can also mess your artwork up. So you have to be careful. Just make sure that you check it afterwards. And if you want to get a bit of extra saving, you can put this in your HT access file, and that'll help just compress SVG, because it is actually just text. So finally, we've got a whole folder full of SVGs, and we're ready to deploy them in some manner on a website or in an app. So last bit of toilet signage. There's a bit of a big gap between the last one, wasn't there? Are you ready? Please hide your potato. <laughs> now, are we done with time? Getting a bit close. So, the way we used to deploy things like icons, all these little graphics, uh, was something like this. So we'd use a sprite. Um, and this was actually Twitter's sprite from only a few years ago. And you know, it meant that we only had one file to load. It was much easier and much better on bandwidth. But it did mean that every time you you change one of these icons or added one, you had to work out this background position. So if you wanted this icon here, you had to tell the CSS file, right, you have to be down there and across there. And it's a bit of a pain in the bum to work with, really. Um, there were some online tools that helped to, um, uh, to do that process a little bit, but um, it was still very hard. But then um, high residue So. <laughs> Wrong cheek, sorry. <laughs> Forgot the microphone was there. High resolution displays uh, meant that we had to have, uh, in this example of a retina, uh, we had to have twice the size of the icon. Um, so for every icon we made, we had to do this at times two version. And that was, you know, that was okay. But then of course, not every high resolution display is a neat times two. So we need something a little bit more scalable. Uh, where we don't have to keep creating lots of different, uh, different icon versions in bitmaps. So the first option here is icon fonts. And there's a simple reason for icon fonts. They're scalable. They're very small files, although you do often have to have um, about five different versions of, of icon font. Uh, they're easily styled with CSS, so that if you've got a, um, a hover state or a focus state or a, a visited state, you can easily add a different color to that icon. You've basically got a path, and you can, you can make that any different color you like. It means you can avoid sprites, which is, again, with a huge relief. And, bizarrely, it was actually supported in IE4+. Plus. So this sounded great. It sounded like a really good, easy solution to deploying scalable icons. Well, it's actually quite a fiddly process. Um, there's no semantic meaning to a lot of these. Um, People who create icon fonts correctly, and Brian Suda will know all about this because he's written a very wonderful pocket guide 
uh, to this. Uh, to put the icon into what's called the private use area of a font. Uh, so rather than saying shopping cart, or oh, let's make that the letter S, um, it's actually taking that away and, and, and meaning that there's no letter ascribed to it, but it also means that there's no meaning to it either. They're only monochrome. So for example, you can change the color of the icon, but the whole icon has got to be the same color. Uh, if there's no font loaded, then you don't get anything. Uh, and also rendering inconsistencies, things like Firefox often renders uh, fonts a little bolder than other ones, which can really sort of mess up your handcrafted icons that you've been spending a long time on. Well, there's a few ways of, of solving some of these problems. So uh, there's a uh, font called Symbol Set that will use ligatures. Remember Jonathan Heffler was talking about ligatures yesterday, these two letters. Uh, and what this can actually do is detect whole words and replace them with the icon, which means the actual meaning is still there. Uh, no color? Well, if you're Apple, their way around it is to shove a PNG image into the actual font itself, which means that you get pixelated poo. <laughs> but generally, in the use case that you use it, you don't tend to notice this. Well, the way around it that the BBC have done is to actually uh, create the separate elements, in this case for their weather symbols, uh, as separate uh, font glyphs. And what they'll do then is put these together um, to give them different colors. But the best solution I think so far has been from Windows. And for the new Windows 8 and uh, Windows 7 phone, I think brought this in as well, um, there's new technology, a new font where you can actually provide color information. So again, You've got the same kind of basis as the BBC, where you're building up these glyphs to get the, the final colored version. Um, but this is all built into the font. And it looks great, but at the moment, it's a Windows-only uh, bit of technology. And as for the fiddly process, well, there's a thing called IcoMoon, which can take a lot of that away from you. If you just provide it with a whole folder of SVGs, you can actually just get the font out the other side. Um, it gets a little bit trickier when you're doing iteration, when you're doing improvements, and you're noticing that a, a certain icon doesn't work. But the biggest problem still with icon fonts is the, uh, the browser support. So this was a, um, it's coming up to a year old now, so these figures probably aren't correct anymore. But this is the filament group research. And the main one is actually being Opera Mini, not supporting um, web fonts. And they estimated around 370 million. Well, that's a big figure but you've got to really look at your audience and know whether that's applicable to you. Uh, for example, Spotify uses uh, icon fonts to do their icons. And um, it works because they generally, people are using their own application. So they, they, they already know the, the, the way it's going to be rendered. Um, but the problem is if you don't have that support, that's what you're going to see instead of a, uh, an icon. So out of all those problems, we've solved a few. Um, but it's still a bit of a fiddly process, and it's still a sort of few rendering inconsistencies. So the, uh, the, what the, the, uh, the process that I prefer, sorry. <laughs> the process, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Have a quick drink. That will solve it. I will speak perfectly from now on. Um, is SVG. Now, we've already created SVG because we were, that's how we exported these icons uh, from our graphics editor. But then it's not necessarily the easiest to actually get onto the web. So let's have a look. With SVG, there's actually there's less steps to do, um, less, less process to get it onto the web. Um, in terms of support, support's not bad. Um, three versions back, uh, IE9 and up, and actually even Opera Mini supports SVG. It does convert it into a bitmap, but you'll still see it. Again, it avoids the use of sprites, so we don't have to work out background positions. Um, with SVG, the option actually there is to have multiple colors if you need them within the icon. And there's actually a way of doing it that's still styleable with CSS, and I'll come to that at the very end. And one of the sexy things is you can actually do animations with it as well. That's a little bit outside the scope of this talk, but um, there's some great tutorials out at the moment. So it's like a very basic way of putting an SVG into your site. If you've got just one file, 
the likelihood is that you might do it like this. You simply put it in as an image tag. But the problem is with needing fallback. You know, what if uh, the browser doesn't support it? Well, this is one way that's been going around on the instance for a while. And the idea is basically to use a bit of JavaScript in line here to say, you know, if this doesn't load, then load the PNG instead. But I'm not very keen on this sort of solution because, first of all, it's, it adds JavaScript as another layer to get it right. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be that JavaScript is turned off in the browser. It could just be simply that the, the JavaScript file um, doesn't work or it doesn't link to the image properly. It's, it's not very progressive enhancement. So the more likely way of doing it is that you'll put it in as a background image. So something like this where um, you'll use Modernizer to detect support for SVG. Um, and by default, serve a PNG. But if SVG is um, supported, then you can add that extra support for, um, for the SVG file. And there's also this thing in HTML5 for custom elements, which will make it a lot more semantic. So potentially, you could start adding things like this, having an icon and a label for it that all has meaning. But this is, a, this is fine for like one or two icons. But if you've got a hard, large icon set for a whole site, you're going to need something a bit more robust than that. And this is where I use something called Grumpicon. Well, it looks like this, actually, because it's on GitHub. And it's, it's basically a grunt task, which is something that, if you've never come across grunt before, it's a, a very nerdy thing that I don't understand. Um, but fortunately, uh, for the people like me who don't want to run grunt tasks, uh, they can just drag and drop it onto a website. So this little unicorn trip drops onto the screen, drag and drop that big folder of SVG files that you've got, and then it outputs lots of magic for you which I think I've just about got enough time to, to show you. So you've got your SVG files, and you put it into the Grumpicon. And what it creates are all these. So at the top, it embeds all your SVG files as data URLs in an SS, a CSS file. It does the same for uh, PNGs as well. And then it creates uh, these fallback files, which I'll come to next. So the idea basically is, on your web page, the script tag looks for support for SVG. If it finds it, it'll sort of serve up that single CSS file with all the icons embedded in it. If it doesn't detect support, it'll supply the PNG. But the great thing is there's a NoScript version as well that will just load basic PNG files. Um, they're not saved as data URLs. And if you've never seen a data URL before, it looks like this. I mean, it does add a bit of weight. It's quite a large way of doing it, but it means that all these icons can be in one single file. So it's essentially like a sprite, but without having to work out the background positions. And that's what this uh, Lonely Planet site uses. That's their technique. A downside of this, comparing it to a font, it's a bit big. No, you're not huge. We're not talking megabytes here, but in this example icon set, I tried both. And certainly, the WAF file was a lot smaller. Now, this is a, the way I, I do my icon fonts now. Sorry, the way I do my icons now. But this is a technique that I'm sure in six months' time will be completely superseded. There'll be something new. Um, and I think as we go into the future, we're not going to need fallbacks. A lot of all this fiddling around is basically to provide fallbacks for browsers that don't support SVG. But when we get to that nice, point in the future where we, we don't have to do that, we can do a lot more with SVG. And if you've read this article on code drops, um, it really sort of opens your mind up to what you can do with it. So for example, what we do here is actually put the SVG code directly into the page. This little bit here is just to position it off screen so it can't be seen. But the important thing here is the ID. So this is basically just the path information. There's no color associated with that, there's no style. It's really just the path of a heart icon. And then we can use that several times within the page. We can reference it by using this. So use xlink heart icon. And we can give it um, a class. And we can say, is it checked or is it outlined? 
We can say all sorts of different things, and this will give us uh, a chance to use an S sorry, a CSS file to, to add things like shadows, use it as an outline. Um, in the tenth example of the clock here, uh, we can even um, make it very semantic. So we can say this path, give it an idea of minute hand, and that can be animated as well. So in the future, uh, this is the way I think we're going to be going. It's more um, using SVG information in a way that's reusable, and it's also very easily styleable with CSS. I don't think we're quite at the stage where we can use this yet, but it does depend on the project. So to say, some projects, you may be able to use this kind of thing. But for now, Grunticon is the way that, uh, that I've been doing it. And that is, I've got the red on here. Is that red time? Is that okay? Yep, good. Um, that is everything I've got to tell you. Sorry, it's a big, long spiel. Um, it's probably got a lot of questions. If you do have questions, please come and talk to me, because um, I'll be around at the conference today. So uh, just come and talk to me and you know, just say hello. Uh, but for now, I just want to thank you for listening. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you.